Well, welcome back to Strategic Advice. I'm Phil Hahn. Uh, I'm your host. And today I am joined uh, by, with uh, Chris Clary, who's an, a, a colleague of mine, longtime colleague, MIT alum and associate professor uh, at the University at Albany in the SUNY uh, system. Uh, welcome, Chris, to MIT Strategic Advice. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So I'll begin with a disclaimer that the views expressed here are strictly our own and not associated with our institutions. And um, I want to just go ahead and get right into this. So, Chris, uh, as you know, this series is aimed at brand new assistant professors, even before they've started uh, their uh, first day on the job. And uh, one of the important topics before you begin to teach courses is negotiating the course load. The types and the number of courses that are taught will have a huge impact on uh, workload and ability to balance in other ways. And so uh, you're an expert uh, at this as an associate professor. And so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you to provide whatever advice you have to assistant professors on nego negotiating courses. Sure, thanks, Phil. You know, when um, you're coming in as a, as a new assistant professor, you've been hired uh, to a new institution, um, you're in a you're in a weird process, uh, and part of that uh, in the in the way that we do it in academia is you'll typically go out for a flyout, um, and all of us who have who who've been lucky to go and get flyouts have gone to interview on site or even do so for a full day remotely with Zoom interviews as sometimes happens now. Um, know that you meet with a lot of faculty. Um, sometimes that's in group settings. Sometimes that's one on one. But in all those settings, there typically is this moment for the candidate, which is often quite confusing about what questions do you have for me? The interviewer asks the candidate and the candidate uh, typically says, well, I'm here to impress you. Right. Like, I, I don't want to bother you. I want to show you that I'll be a good colleague. Uh, but course selection is actually a perfectly fine topic to raise in those in those settings. Um, you know, that what types of courses do tenure stream faculty typically offer? Uh, do those courses have teaching assistance? Um, how much um, how much do I need to go off of courses that are currently offered in the undergraduate and graduate bulletin versus have the opportunity to build courses of my own? What is going to be the mix of seminar versus lecture classes? All of those are perfectly reasonable questions to ask. And if you do so with a with an air that you will be flexible and um, and will be a good colleague, there's no reason those questions will be harmful either. And you're that perfect time, perfect opportunity to fill that time. And that will give you some knowledge that you can bring to bear. Then if you are so lucky to get a call from the chair or the dean telling you that you've been selected as the preferred candidate. Now, the other thing that is odd about the way that we do it in academia is if you're doing course selection, course selection is just one of many dimensions that you're trying to optimize in the negotiation. Uh, so you've got this multidimensional uh, negotiation going on where you're trading off things uh, and then you're doing so in the context of an iterated game where you just don't have a one time payoff, but you're instead having to deal with this chair or dean or your colleagues could possibly for the rest of your life, really. I mean, possibly for three decades. So you don't you don't want to leave too much on the table. But you also don't want to poison the well before you get to an institution. Um, so the the challenge is demanding the right amount and then figuring out what your trade offs are um, across different places. So they may institutions have very idiosyncratic needs um, for their for their faculty. Uh, you know the the defense educational institutions that you know very well, Phil. They may have curriculum, the, the curricula that they've negotiated with, uh, you know, the services in the in the Pentagon, basically, and they have less flexibility sometimes. But in other places, the curricula could be almost entirely made up, um, and especially for the uh, courses offered at the junior or senior level, they may allow for enormous amount of flexibility on topics, so long as there are certain courses that are 
perhaps writing intensive, or there are other needs the department is, is trying to achieve. So it is good, I think, in your mind, as you're going on the job uh, market, and this is probably already in most people's teaching statement, to have an idea of what courses they are going to want to teach. That will be something in the back of the minds of the of the committee. Um, some committees are going to value those those course offerings highly, and in other places, it will be an afterthought, um, much beyond the research or other dimensions the candidate has to offer. And then the other challenge I think with course negotiations is every department is different about who is the decision maker that's responsible for making those those course offering choices each semester. So in some departments that may reside primarily at the subfield level where you're negotiating primarily with your colleagues, for me in international relations, other people in comparative politics, et cetera. Uh, and other people, it might be the chair and still other, it might even be some needs are, are kept track of at the dean level. Um, and so there's gonna be a limited trade-off. So when you go in, you want to have a, a handle on what types of courses you desire to teach. Do you want more focused courses or would you like to be able to guide people through a survey of the subfield? I'll teach an international relations intro course. Um, or would you like to teach on your narrow area of, of, of interest? Um, do they need people to get students excited and in the seats? And if so, then you'll want to offer a course that at least on a branding basis is of interest to those students? Or are they less concerned about that? And they have other faculty that can offer more high demand courses. And then um, do, are they gonna need you to teach a course that's a stretch for you that's beyond your um, core focus? And if so, that's a good conversation to have about whether you're comfortable doing so. And that will almost certainly entail more prep on your part. And so you may ask to do that in a later semester um, when you're not having to deal with the move and all of the the one or the the, the initial um, costs that come with becoming a, a junior assistant professor. All right. Well, they, I, you've done a great job of uh, establishing the context and some of the decision makers. And I'm a game theory guy, so I love the way you've laid this out. Um, can you get into a little bit more advice in uh, two parts? One, in terms of um, the trade-off, uh, near and long-term trade-offs with teaching and um, course deferral for research because tenure clock is ticking loudly for these guys now, as well as some more specific advice, on, like what's what you think is reasonable, like balance between lecture and seminar as far as time goes? Sure. Um the first thing that you should be cognizant of is try to figure out what the institutional norms are. The field has bifurcated or trifurcated. So there are some teaching intensive institutions where they are going to be very skeptical of every time you walk away on leave. There are some institutions, even if you have money from an outside funder, they are going to be skeptical of letting you use that on a course buyout. So one thing you can talk about uh, going in is if you think you're doing research that might attract outside funding, um, are they amenable to course buyouts or not? Um, and if they are not, then you should know that uh, going into the equation. Uh, the other thing that um, is good to be aware of going into an institution is um, whether or not uh, there are people in the institution that are teaching courses that you would like to teach. Uh, it is very common for an older senior faculty member to kind of sit on a course with a good title. You know, causes of war would be a classic one in international relations, American foreign policy. And, you know, you'll want to figure out whether that person wants to share responsibilities for that course. If, if they do want to um, alternate, then they may have strong views about how the course should be taught. Um, and, and that can be something for you to navigate, uh, or they could be, a, a you know, a, a good collegial, uh, comrade who is happy to, to share the burden there. Um, it is typical for there to be a semester of leave at most research institutions, uh, roughly midway 
uh, through the tenure clock, even if there is not, um, even if there's not said outside grants that pay for that sort of leave. So that is something that is very good to talk to junior faculty about. Um, as you're in the negotiation with the deans, it is very common for deans not to offer things unless asked. Um, and so you should be mindful uh, on salary, uh, on, on many things that sometimes deans just want to hold stuff until you ask for it. And then it's easy for them to say yes. So your other junior faculty that have gone through this process recently are going to be your best guides at that institution, um, and as well as people that have gone through that at peer institutions in the recent past. These, this standard really varies enormously, in my experience, across different types of store, schools. And so in some places, uh, a 3-3, three, three, sometimes even a 4-4 four, four load will be normal. Uh, and then in other places, a 2-1 load will be the norm. Or in quarter systems, some a 2-0-2 two, two or something like that, where there's a lot of breaks built in uh, for teaching. And the demands at a semester or quarter system institution are very different. And you'll want to talk to people, both junior faculty that can that are going to be willing to be truthful with you at the incoming institution, as well as any peers in your cohort, the cohort above, that have gone through that process recently, um, because there's just too much idiosyncratic variation to be able to give um, blanket advice, except for everywhere that has a tenure um, clock will know that that colleagues below the tenure threshold are going to need some more time for research. The other thing I should, I think, junior faculty should ask about explicitly, um, ideally the schools will raise this, but junior faculty are at a point in their life when major events happen to them. And that could be children, uh, which is sometimes a delicate uh, topic for fa faculty to raise because they don't want uh, to imply, especially for maybe older colleagues who may have outmoded ideas about the family, that they'll they'll drop off for a while to do child rearing. But frankly, also in our age, it has to do with parental illness and death. So are there accommodations in the event of some sort of major medical event? And that can be a positive event like childbirth or a negative one like an ailing uh, elder uh, parent. Um, you know, are there accommodations that can be made to allow a person to deal with that without causing uh, a crisis, a bigger crisis in their life that now has both professional and personal dimensions? And schools should be upfront. Almost all schools have some sort of policy for family medical or parental leave, and they should be clear about that in either in the, in the faculty guidebook uh, or in the onboarding process as you're going through the negotiations. And if they're not upfront, it's better to have a conversation early, especially after the verbal offer uh, is in hand. Uh, some of these conversations make sense not to take place prior to a verbal or written offer, and then other things make sense to have after you have that verbal or written offer that's harder for them uh, procedurally to retract. Yeah, uh, I tell you, Chris, as a former dean, you're spot on as far as the negotiations. It's, it's a two-way street. And so uh, those who are making the offers, they want to be able to say yes to different things, so they won't just put things on the table immediately. And also, so if they say yes to that, don't think you're saturating the, the amount of requests. That's just a natural part of the process. Um, so I think, I think we've got, uh, that's ab about as much time as we have for this topic. We could talk about this topic. Uh, I've got a number of questions down here, uh, particularly in terms of uh, like the relationship between research and the courses that you teach and the amount of time for undergraduates and graduate type courses to invest. Uh, but we're going to save that for another day. Uh, so anyway, Chris, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, provide advice uh, to grad students.